I'm Mary Hogan Prusi. Uh, I'm a senior advisor to Fifth Wall, um, which is a venture capital company that focuses on, on the built world. And I also sit on several corporate boards. Um, and I'm really honored to be bringing back the Investor Roundtable to this conference. Um, this has been a great day so far. I've learned a lot. We're hearing from the best in the business. And you're hearing from incredible CEOs, um, incredible management teams. And they're telling you, you know, what, what investors want. Um, we're going to tell you what investors want because we're investors. Um, so I think that this will be super helpful. You might hear some of the same questions, but you'll hear them answered in a, in a, in a different way. Um, and I'll just go really quick down the road. Um, next to me is Nick Joseph, head of US REIT and lodging team at Citi. Next to him is Lisa Kaufman, head of LaSalle Global Solutions at LaSalle Investment Management. Next to her, Cedric Lachance, director of research at Green Street. And all the way down there, Hi, Gina. Gina Szymanski, director and PM at AEW. Um, so let's get to it. Um, you know, investing in REITs is a tricky thing um, because you have to think about a short-term strategy because you're trying to beat a benchmark. You're trying to, you know, you're, you're, you're managing a stock portfolio, but you're also looking at very long-term fundamentals because at a level, you know, you're responding to real estate fundamentals. Um, one of my favorite sayings, um, and I have a lot of them, in the industry is that real estate people are never wrong, only early. Um, and uh, that, that, that tends to play out all the time. Um, I thought it'd be great to start uh, talking about the current environment. You know, we've been thrown, after being thrown a bunch of curveballs, um, you know, starting in 2020 with COVID and um, so many unexpected things, just in the last 12 months, you know, uh, we've thrown even more from a Fed policy perspective, a geopolitical stability perspective, and most recently, the stability of U.S. banks. Um, so my first question to the group is, you know, how, how drastically has your investment strategy pivoted in reaction to bank lending concerns, if at all? Um, and I think Jean is going to kick us off and put it in a little bit of context to what we've all been through as investors in the last couple of years. <clears throat> thanks, Mary, and thanks, everyone, uh, for having me here. Um, it was really exciting when I found out that I was going to be invited here, and I had a great time last night, so thank you. Um, so I'll start kind of after COVID, and by after COVID, I mean uh, right when the Pfizer vaccine was announced. So um, everything obviously had a tough time um, at the beginning parts of COVID, but then once the Pfizer vaccine um, was announced, uh, you really wanted to allocate capital quickly to the sectors that were going to benefit from a reopening theme. Um, so anything where occupancy got um, hit during COVID, any, any sector where they had rent collection problems, um, the uglier the better, right? So hotels, retail, um, and the like. So um, once, so because uh, it took a lot of stimulus to um, drive the reopening, then soon investors started to worry about uh, inflation and how to combat that inflation with higher interest rates. Um, so we heard uh, last night, um, you know, Blackstone was talking about how their approach was uh, to offset inflation is to bet on growth. And that's historically been uh, the case, right? The best way to uh, offset multiple compression or cap rate expansion is to bet on growth. Um, so think residential, industrial, um, and that type of thing. The only problem with that was it was kind of short-lived because interest rates rose, then rose so precipitously um, that people had to start thinking about the concept of negative leverage. And what, hap what I mean by negative leverage is those companies with higher growth, the fastest growth, started at the lowest cap rates. And when interest rates rose, suddenly those cap rates were inverted to the cost of capital. And the public market said, well, that's not sustainable. Um, and so quickly, uh, the market shifted to growth where you could find higher cap rates, so higher cap rate growth, so think hotels again, and also net lease. Um, and then, uh, then you fast forward to today, or just in recent, recent um, months, where you had uh, Silicon Valley, Signature Bank, Credit Suisse, um, and all the, all the turmoil in the capital markets, um, and so about now balance sheets are back in focus. Um, but don't get too defensive for too long because if it gets ugly enough, then uh, the Fed's going to pivot. And um, as you saw on the day that Silicon Valley uh, was taken over by the Fed, um, 
REITs were up. So. Thanks so much. Um, you know, uh, Connor Flynn, one of my favorite CEOs, said earlier today um, that, you know, generational opportunities do happen when, when people are fearful. Um, and it's not lost on me, as someone who's been in this industry for a long time, that um, a, big, a big reason why we have so many prominent real estate companies choose the public format has been in response to some kind of a financial crisis. Um, uh, so, you know, which, there's, which, there's opportunities and, and then there's risks. Um, so my next question is, you know, how, how has your perspective changed uh, on opportunity versus risk, both in your own portfolio and the companies um, in, in, that you're managing and um, what you think the company should be doing? You know, you know, again, you know, my lesson of history is that there's opportunity in here somewhere, but you don't want to be the person that, 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 that buys the thing that's already down when it's about to go, you know, down a lot more. Um, Nick, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's an um, honor to be here, and particularly as an NYU alum, uh, a special honor. Uh, to your question, look, I think there's always opportunities. Um, what we have done is look back historically at the top quartile of REIT performance in any individual year versus the bottom quartile. And on average, that's about 50 percentage points. So there's a lot of alpha opportunity within the broader REIT space. The hard part is getting it right. We luckily get a pine on that. Uh, you guys actually have to do the hard work there. Um, you know, I, I would say it comes down to time horizon, what we're really focused on. We're typically looking a year and out. Um, what we're mostly focused on is businesses that are generating good cash flow that have supportive supply and demand fundamentals. Um, obviously, there's shorter term opportunities that could be valuation driven or a lot of the things that Gina was touching on in terms of macro driven but we remain very focused on the fundamentals of the business. And so where we're seeing opportunities today, we continue to like the industrial sector, we continue to like the residential sector, uh, we like the shopping center side, and we're finding select opportunities within storage, lodging, and some of the other ones as well. Um, Elisa, what about you? I'd love to hear um, what sectors you like. Uh, also, how, you know, how much you're, how you're marrying short-term thinking with, um, with portfolio construction over a longer term. Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll start by saying we are currently underwriting a recession in our cash flow estimates. So that's a really key assumption that we're making. And we think, you know, we don't know, but that's our best guess. And that's, we think that happens in the next year or so. So that is, that is driving our, uh, our view of valuation across the sectors today. Um, and it's, it's, uh, leading us to have a bias towards sectors that have more secular or structural growth tailwinds than others. So I would put uh, single family homes, storage, cell towers kind of in that camp today. We think those cash flows will be more resilient. It's, it's, refle it's, it's reflected in our valuations. At the same time, I think your point about opportunity being born out of dislocation or distress is a really good one. And one of the key things we are debating in our investment team meetings every week is, you know, are, with these these economically sensitive sectors that have that have really underperformed, you know, are they cheap enough now? Are they getting cheap enough that we would be willing to step in front of what we think will be a recession in the not too distant future? So, there we're you know we're looking at sectors like apartments and hotels and billboards and wait for it even even office. So. <laughs> That is the nicest thing that anyone said about office office, <laughs> minus the office CEO. Um, and I'm not here to pick on office. Um, I feel like I, my, my personal perspective is it's, it's really very similar to what we saw with the malls. Still a good business. There's just fewer great ones than there were a few years ago. Um, Cedric, um, you know, you're, you're on the record for many years about your feelings about this space. Um, and I, I'd, I'd love to know what catalysts you're looking for that will give you confidence in this sector. Um, love some clues. Yeah. yeah, so you gave me the easy question, right? Let's, <laughs> let's figure out if it's time to invest in office. Um, so, so Green Street has been uh, negative about private market values in office for a very, very long time, a solid decade at the very least. Um, if you look at private market values in office, assuming that you can get to a cap rate, and those cap rates that we tend to use are more based on transactions that don't occur rather than transactions that occur, so deals that fall through and you try to find out who the bidders or where the bidders were at. 
even at the prices that you see that deals uh, would have been bid for, we still don't think office is attractive. So that's the private market. Uh, the beauty of the public market is it knows all of that. It's way ahead of the game. And when you look at what a public market is, and that was mentioned earlier, I think, by Owen, um, we're down about 50% in asset values in the public market. So if you go peak office values from 15 months ago to today what's priced by the public market, you're about 50% drop in asset values, which means that you have New York REITs that trade at 9 and 10 implied cap rates. It means that you have some actually Sunbelt REITs that trade at 10 to 12% cap rates. Um, those are nominal cap rates. In the real world of cash flows, you got to cut 300 basis points from that because uh, the office business is consuming an enormous amount of ongoing capital to attract tenants. So TIs and just general maintenance of these buildings is significant. But even then, you end up at an implied cap rate that is uh, the highest or one of the highest in uh, the REIT space. So when we look at the ranking of the office business versus other sectors, we now have in the public market office about in the middle of the pack. So worth a serious discussion as to whether or not you take a flyer now on the office business. Um, for us, it then becomes a question of being more choosy uh, on that. So the, the Sunbelt environment in office still remains the most appealing from our perspective. That's where you'll get the best cash flow growth. That's where we think the values are going to be most enticing over the next several years. So there's, there's a bit of a tilt to companies that are more focused on the Sun Belt. And in general, in the private market, um, if one was to invest in office, we would do it also in the, in, in the Sun Belt. Um, so we're not yet willing to say that, uh, let's say, in a portfolio manager speak, we'd be overweight office. Uh, but it is a very serious consideration, at the very least, in terms of where the entry points are versus other businesses. Thanks. Um, that's good news for Cousins, who was just up here. <laughs> um, uh, I want to stick with you on uh, my next topic. Um, we were prepping for this panel. Cedric said, don't ask me about dividends. And then he had like this massive answer about dividends. So I'm going to ask you. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and again, you know, uh, when we think about lessons of the past, um, uh, as you reflect on, on where we are this time, you know, um, like Christina was saying on the last panel, um, uh, during COVID, a lot of companies temporarily um, stopped paying a dividend, and then they brought back a very reduced dividend, and people were kind of fine with it. And historically, you know, cutting the dividend has been the third rail for companies. Um, and so, you know, we've seen some dividend cuts now in the office sector, which have been reacted to real negatively. Um, just wondering if you'll st still see more of that and whether you think it's a, it's a prudent move um, to conserve capital or whether it really should be sacrosanct. Yeah. Um, so, so I see real estate as a total return vehicle, not as a dividend vehicle necessarily. Uh, a lot of owners, a lot of REITs will market themselves to some degree with some sustainability in the dividend and the importance of a certain dividend. Uh, there is definitely an element of cutting the dividend being seen as extremely negative. It has to be done generally only in dire circumstances. But from our perspective, we just think about what's the total return potential of this business. It's not, am I going to get a 2% yield, a 4% yield? Um, it's, it's a lot less relevant to us. The, the, the long term, when you look at um, why dividends matter in all of this, A, obviously, it's because you have to pay a certain amount to maintain the REIT, uh, the REIT regulations. But when you go beyond that, a lot of companies pay well, well above what that bare minimum could be. From our standpoint, what is very important is to think about the overall cash flow generation of the business, so the ability to grow, the ability to uh, deliver on a, a truly on an economic value basis, so meaning post capex, what kind of returns can you generate? And when it comes to the dividend policies, um, it is much more about, from, from my standpoint, if you have a business where you can continue to deploy capital in an accretive fashion, try to maintain the dividend as, as low as possible. The, uh, cutting element is often seen very negatively by the public market. In most cases, even if we all know, and what I mean by that is most investors have a very good sense that, that dividends have to be cut for a certain company, the stock will still go down on the day of the announcement. Um, by contrast, in many cases, it's done, I'd say, in a smart way. A lot of dividend cuts are proper in order to maintain capital, to maintain a balance sheet position, to be able to sometimes just survive. 
Uh, and, and from that standpoint, I think there are no issues for companies that choose to go down that path when it's critical for them, when it's truly a cash preservation mechanism that's needed. Thanks. You mind if I add on a Yeah, please. Yeah, no, I, I would say I, I mostly agree with what Cedric said. Um, you know, right now we have dividends at about 70% of cash flow right now. Obviously, there's a taxable minimum. Uh, we saw a handful reset uh, to that level. Um, you know, we're expecting dividend growth from here. There's obviously some exceptions. I think for REITs, when they get above about a 90% payout ratio, we start to pay attention a bit more there. Um, I, I would echo the total return comment. Uh, obviously, that's what I think everyone should be focused on. But we went back to the late 90s and looked at the percentage of that total return that was associated with the dividend and the reinvestment of that dividend. It was about 45%. And so it's definitely a pretty con uh, considerate amount of the total return consideration, but obviously making sure the free cash flow and finding the best use for that's important. Right. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Um, Lisa, Gina, anything, any, th any particular thought? Are you buying stocks for yield? Do you avoid stocks if you think a dividend cut is imminent? Are you just, is, you know, how important is it to your, to your under underwriting? Yeah, we're, we're total return investors as well, but I think we would be cautious about jumping in front of a imminent dividend cut if we thought it was happening, um, just from an entry point perspective, but not from a consideration of whether or not the stock is a good investment. Yeah, I would, I would say the same thing. Um, hesitant to get in front of a dividend cut, but uh, similar to um, Lisa and Cedric, you know, total return is the way we think about it. Um, that's dividend yield plus NAV growth, uh, plus any kind of recouping that you can get from your discount or premium if you have it. Um, and so, you know, what I would say is just make that trade off in terms of what's best for your company in terms of future value, right? So if you're going to maintain that dividend and it's gonna cause you to raise dilutive equity and the NAV growth is gonna be impacted by that, I mean, then you're not any better for it. So, you know, do what's gonna add to the total return of your company. Thanks. Um, moving, uh, continuing on this theme of sort of lessons of history and what we've seen in previous crises, you know, um, I think it's pretty uncertain, um, uh, you know, how extensive the current bank crisis is going to be. Um, it does seem it does seem highly likely that uh, you know lending is going to be curtailed for for real estate in general. Um, so that's just one less tool that um, that all real estate companies have in terms of their um, in terms of their capital structure and meeting maturities. And we've got plenty that have plenty of maturities um, in the next in near term in the next two years. You know, um, following the great, in the great financial crisis, we had many, many REITs do these recapitalization trades, um, you know, selling equity deep discount to NAV, almost like a survival trade. Um, and, um, uh, you, know, if, you know, some companies now deeply regret those, but I mean, how can you regret that when you're still here, right? Um, I, just, I was wondering, Nick, do you, do you, do you think that's a comparable, do you, do you see any, any analog, analogy between that time and now? Do you think we could see some of those deep discount trades? Yeah, I, I think there potentially could be. It obviously depends on kind of the macro situation. Our city house view is a mild recession in the back half of 2023. Obviously, we're seeing credit uh, constraint a bit more. But I would say from the public REIT perspective today versus 2008, the balance sheets are in a much better position. Yeah. So if you look at net debt to EBITDA, you're considerably lower, same to debt to GAV. You, know, you can argue what uh, GAV is right now, but uh, either way, we think there's much more of a cushion there. Um, you know, there's a handful of names, obviously, you know, not to pile on office, but there's a handful of names in office where, um, you know, maybe the operating fundamentals aren't as strong and the balance sheets aren't as uh, well positioned. Uh, but I would say, in general, the cash flows across REITs for almost all the sectors are still very constructive. Um, obviously, they could be impacted somewhat uh, by a downturn. We would expect that they would be. Um, but I think we're entering any downturn in a much better position than what we've seen in the past. Right. Thanks. Um, also, uh, you know, uh, what, what advice do you have for, um, for REITs in this environment? What, what are you telling your companies? Um, Lisa, you know, uh, you know are you, how are you talking to them about balance sheet and buybacks, and strategic opportunities? Yeah, well, I, you know, the, the advice that I would give REIT management teams, you, you heard a lot of the REIT managers on the first panel talk about some of these things, so um, I think they're getting the message from a lot of people and, and have learned from history. But today, it's, you know, my, my advice is focus really hard on the balance sheet, 
build dry powder and be patient. I mean, we, we think that we're in the early stages of evaluation reset in the private real estate market. Um, and so if you, if you are a REIT today and you have the opportunity to sell assets at yesterday's prices or even today's prices, I would say that, that's a, that do it <laughs> um, and be in a position, you know, if, if history is a guide, the, the REITs, you've heard it over and over again, REITs tend to lead and they have led obviously in the downturn here as real estate value, uh, values are resetting with higher real rates. Um, we think that they will lead, likely lead in the recovery and that may mean that REITs for the first time in a very long time have a cost of capital advantage. And if that cost of capital advantage marries up with a need for equity recapitalization in swaths of the private real estate market, which we would expect expect that's that that could happen um, that could be a really that could be one of those generational opportunities where REITs can play the role of consolidator where REITs can play the role of con, uh, rescue capital where we could see IPO activity again so um, my advice to to REITs today is just put yourself in a position to be able to capitalize on that opportunity if and when it comes that's great um, Gina wanted to know you know if, you know how you feel about what Lisa just said, and then I also wanted to ask you about activism. Um, you know, is from your perspective as an investor, which is different from a corporate, do you think it's a good thing or, or a bad thing? Um, <clears throat> so I'll answer the, um, I'll just pile on to Lisa's comments first, but um, in terms of uh, advice I would give to managements right now is just think about um, what you want your company to look like after the volatility. Not that we're ever done with the volatility, but, but think about w what it's gonna look like. One of my least favorite things a company does um, is uh, slicing their top assets and putting it into a JV. Um, you, you know, a few years from now, if you do that, um, you're left with less, less quality assets um, and a more complicated accounting structure. Um, so what, why? You know, I mean, there's obviously reasons to do that, um, and so everything in moderation, but, but it is um, just that that would be my advice is don't do anything you're not willing to live with. Um, and then um, and everything deserves a premium or discount down the road. Um, in terms of activism, um, I, I mean, I, I, I welcome it. I know it's a pain. Um, it could be expensive for um, board members and that type of thing. But um, I think recently we've seen examples of how it's a little bit more friendly or less hostile, if you will. Um, you know, b management's willing to hear what the activists have to say. I mean, they're not always out for a hostile takeover. Um, and to the extent that, you know, managements and boards are willing to listen to advice, um, I think I've seen examples um, of companies that uh, come out <clears throat> producing better fundamentals as a result. Um, so so when, I, when I see an activist getting involved, um, Number one, I look at the reaction of the company, um, and if it's, um, if it's open to the feedback, I think that's a good thing. Great, thanks. Um, uh, uh, you know, I sit on a bunch of REIT boards, um, and so I wanted to ask uh, Nick and Cedric, you know, I'm asking for a friend, obviously, yeah, you know, yeah. what advice do you have for, for REIT boards at, at the moment? Yeah, I can start. Um, so first, I love activism. So I'll say that. I, th I think <laughs> activism is great for, it's, it truly I think it's great for the industry. Um, I, I cover European markets as well uh, from the Green Street perspective and it's sorely lacking in activism and you see it in the quality of the companies that uh, you have in the pool of investment potential on REIT. So uh, activism plays a tremendously important role um, and that's the way to start, I guess, on the board answers because I think activism is at the top of the fears for boards um, and certainly not getting a letter is probably at the top of the activities uh, on the to-do list. And um, unfortunately, activism actually is a, is a good thing, so you shouldn't be scared of it, you shouldn't be against it. So uh, advice to boards, uh, so first let's start with the reality. Um, I don't sit on the board, and <laughs> uh, I have a decent sense that it's extremely hard to manage a business, but I think all of us underestimate how difficult it is, so I'll, I'll admit to that to start. Uh, from a board perspective, I think, uh, from, at least from a Green Street perspective, 
Board members are there to represent the shareholders. So board members, their first task is to be the voice of the shareholders. And they should be thinking like owners of the shares and thinking like the long-term owners of the shares and therefore act in that fashion. They should be uh, becoming ever more knowledgeable about the business. I think there's a wide range of knowledge among board members and an important part perhaps of the management teams is to educate the board members on the business, but broadly not just our own uh, particular sector, uh, but the business broadly of real estate. So I think that's very important to develop the knowledge. Um, I think that being engaged enormously on the key components of capital allocation, of balance sheet management, and again, understanding what that means. Uh, and then some of the, the softer elements of understanding the culture of the firm. Um, and of course, uh, continuing to, to ascertain risks and being at the forefront of risks. And the final thing is, uh, the board is, is truly there as representative of the shareholders, therefore is there to make sure that the management team is the right management team. And it, ultimately, I think in REITs, we don't see that many changes in management teams. Sometimes you see some pretty meaningful blunders and then the management team continues along. And that seems like the board is therefore not totally doing what they should be doing. Uh, and then the final thing I would say is board members should be working themselves out of a job eventually. <laughs> there should be a term limit to it and there should be a willingness to sell the company when there is a true valuable offer on the table. Uh, so being a board member should be seen as a temporary gig, not a lifetime appointment. Um, you make a good point about CEOs and I think after the financial crisis, two CEOs lost their job. Yep. In, in our industry when the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the future of the read industry was very much in question. That's, that's a really good point. Nick, what do you think about all that? Yeah, um, you know, I would just add, I guess, on the first on the activism comment, um, I don't think all activists are the same, right? I think it's very easy to say the stock is cheap, sell the company, right? That, that's a very short-term, um, easy kind of letter to write. I'd say, I, I think there's, plenty of activists that have very good ideas um, that the board should engage with and listen to. Maybe they're the right ideas, maybe they're the wrong ideas, but at least being open to the ideas of long-term value creation, I think is a very important thing for the board to take into account. The other thing I would just add, I, I agree with uh, everything Cedric had, had said on uh, kind of advice, it's really about creating alignment of interest uh, and the right incentives. And so making sure that management is aligned with shareholders in terms of the comp plan, um, and everything else that goes into it to create long-term value for the shareholders. Right. Great. Mary, Mary, you sit on the board. You sit on four <laughs> boards, right? I do. You're on four currently? I do sit on four boards. Okay. What do you think board members should do? I know. I was like, wait, Cedric, you don't like my job? <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's all different things. Um, I, 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 I love what I do. I feel really proud to do what, what both Nick and Cedric talked about, which is to be the investor perspective in the, in the boardroom and the feeling of being correct about investor sentiment when um, bringing in a popular opinion to management, um, but having the confidence to know it's just the same as being right on a stock. It really is. Um, and so I feel, you know, Part of the reason I spend a lot of time in places like this um, is I don't ever want to get stale and out of touch with what's going on. Um, and I, I would say from an activism perspective, you know, active, the actual activism is a nightmare for, for boards and companies in the sense that it's expensive. It's a huge time, it's a huge distraction, and it could be a reputational hit. Um, but I do agree that it is really healthy and, and, good, for, and good for companies. And I will also say that one of the easiest um, holes you can leave open for an activist is to have a bad board. Um, and a bad board could mean a board that's been together for too long, a board that doesn't have relevant skills, a board that is not diverse. I mean, there's, you know, the, the, there's a lot of ways you can describe that. And so I do think that um, this I increased activism that we've seen over the last few years has helped people to really shore up um, everything on their governance side and be really mindful of these issues. Um, and, and even to that end, I think you will see more, I think the boards themselves feel really accountable, not that they don't all like their jobs, um, and they feel more accountable in terms of how they evaluate the CEO. So I, th you know, so I, I think it's, it's going to be different this time. Um, Can I lob in one more comment yes. about activism? Just 
and, and I agree with everything that's been said, and, and I think it's, it's more good than bad for sure, especially when it leads companies to self-help and that unlocks shareholder value. That's the best outcome. But one kind of potential negative consequence of it is it can also lead to privatization, and we've seen a lot of, a, a big wave of privatization over the last, you know, five plus years in the REIT industry, and, you know, selfishly as a REIT dedicated investor, I don't like to see that. I want to have a robust, diverse sandbox to build portfolios from and have, and have good companies. And then, you know, a little more altruistically, I, I want to see these assets stay in the public domain. I want public shareholders to have access to this real estate. That was the whole point of the REIT structure, really, to begin with. So, you know, I, I think there, there is a little bit of a balance there. Um, and, and I hope that, that when there is activism, the boards take it to heart and look for it to be a catalyst to unlock shareholder value rather than just, you know, hit the bid and, and, and move on. Yeah, yeah, here, here. We are, I think we're a vital part of the, of the real estate industry. Um, this, I'm going to segue into sort of the next phase of our conversation now. You know, um, uh, the reported, reported valuation disparity between public and private companies ha has never been so wide. Um, you know, um, Guy Metcalf said previously on, um, on the last panel, he believes that public REITs uh, valuations lead private valuations. Um, Matt Lustig said that NAV is like using an abacus or Lotus <laughs> one, two, three, like that doesn't matter. Um, real estate values don't, you know, NAV doesn't matter when it applies to, to real estate. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to ask, uh, I want to ask you guys, you know, you know, which side is going to blink first in terms of valuation? You know, who's going to, you know, are, are, are REITs going to move up? Is our public valuations going to be more realistic? Um, do we meet in the middle? Maybe I'll start with you, Nick. Sure, absolutely. I think um, I'd agree with the premise of your, uh, of your question there. Um, obviously, the liquidity in the public market um, has shown that cap rates have moved out considerably on an implied cap rate basis relative to the transaction volume that we've seen actually in the private market. Now, I know a lot of panelists have talked about before, so I won't repeat it, but we've seen very few deals priced. Our view is that the deals that have priced have been much closer to the seller expectations, and so there's a wide bid-ask spread in the market today. Sellers really haven't needed to sell outside of any kind of debt coming due. Um, and as I mentioned before, operating fundamentals and cash flows have actually been pretty positive. And so if you're holding on to a asset today that was maybe worth 25% more a year ago, unless you need to make that decision, you may wait to see what happens on the debt capital market side. Uh, whereas the public markets, I think, have priced in um, a lot more cap rate expansion. I think it probably meets somewhere in the middle. Um, I would expect as debt starts to come due, that will be the impetus for more and more deals to occur. And we would expect cap rates to start to move up uh, given where debt costs are today. It's hard to tell how much. I think each asset class is very different. Um, I think something like industrial, where you have very large mark to markets, maybe the going in cap rates stay a bit stickier, uh, giving you can solve the IRR more through cash flow growth. Uh, where shorter lease duration sectors, maybe you see the cap rates move up a bit to adjust to where debt costs are today. What do you think, Cedric? Yeah. Um, so, so it's true that it's difficult to identify cap rates in a variety of sectors because we have minimal transactions. But like I said earlier, you do have deals that fall through. You do have indication of interest from bidders. We talk to enough people that are active or trying to be active at the very least in the market, and you get a sense as to where assets might be priced. So if I, let's take a bit of a step back. Um, what's occurred over the last 15 months is that real rates have gone up. So you used real rates. I think you're the first at the conference that's used real rates so far. So let's talk about real rates. We, we understand. So, <laughs> so it's, it's going to be the geeky part of the discussion, right? Um, so about, about a year ago, real rates were negative 100, 125 basis points. Uh, today, they're positive 100 basis points, 125. So that's basically saying that your discount rate has gone up 200 plus basis points with relatively no change to your expectations on cash flow growth. The result from that is asset values are down. So the public market has grasped it particularly well. It's very visible. Um, if you think about the private market and the reaction, and you think about the reaction also in the bond market, you would say that, um, so first, asset values to us are down 15% in the private market. When you look at the relationship between where debt is priced, so both the corporate debt broadly, but also the real estate debt, you would say there's another 5 to 10% decline that should occur. 
So peak or previous peak about a year and change ago to today, you should see a decline in asset values on average in the real estate space of about 25%. The public market has actually factored all of that in. So the public market is sitting today at about that 25%. Public market is trading at 7 to 10% GAV discount. So that decline that should be occurring over time still in the real estate assets. Um, so from our perspective, you've got a public market that is actually, um, that has appropriately thought through what the bond environment is, what the values are, uh, or what they should be in the private market. So while you have appraisers out there that are driving forward and looking backwards, uh, which has to be incredibly dangerous if they're truly driving, um, and giving answers that are dubious at best, the public market has an answer, and that answer is that values have declined uh, dramatically. What I think is going to occur over time is we are gonna see an, a, a full with liquidity repricing in the private market. The public will start looking forward. So then we'll get into an environment where we do have premium stand AVs. Across the board, I'm using across the board, it might be a little too generous, but in most property sectors, and it should allow the REITs in about uh, six to 12 months from now to be a lot more active uh, in the marketplace and to live what we think they should be living, which is being a consolidator of assets because REITs tend to be better operators, tend to have uh, better balance sheets overall, tend to have better access to capital and should be able to take advantage of what's going to occur because in some sectors, without a doubt, there's going to be a fair amount of dislocation. Office is easy to pick on, uh, but there should be some dislocation, for instance, and Ben talked about that on some of the apartment development deals. So you're gonna see a little bit of that occurring and giving the chance to REITs to come in and be active and exactly fulfill their mandate effectively. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I feel excited about the opportunity. Um, uh, you know, that said, um, you know, another, um, another frustrating thing about REITs is um, REITs don't always, you know, they don't, they, they really, you know, as much as, uh, you know, we say sometimes they act like stocks and sometimes act like real estate, they really only act like real estate when real estate is bad and then, then they act like yeah, stocks, yeah. it seems to me. Um, and I brought this question up at the, the dinner we had last night and I gave a long history lesson that no one at the dinner actually needed. Um, so I'm gonna be a little shorter with that. Um, but you know, REITs have existed for, for over 60 years. Um, the modern era started with, with the Kimco IPO in 1991. Um, REITs were added to the S&P in October 2001 or November, it was EQR I believe was the first one. Um, in 2006, a ton of other REITs got added. Um, and we became our own asset class um, within the S&P in 2016. Um, and since then, you know, a lot has changed. When you look at the benchmark, when you look at the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the REITs from large to small, our benchmark is really top heavy with companies for whom you really might not say um, real estate is their primary business. Um, uh, our benchmark in terms of investors is dominated by index funds. Index funds are the largest owners of REITs, um, which makes it challenging for active managers. So, um, you know, and so the investor is asking for us, they're asking for earnings growth, liquidity, and yield for REITs, and to, to beat all other kinds of stocks in terms of a total return. Um, and so, you know, you know, and I'm not sure every company in our universe can deliver that. And so I've been sort of musing about whether it's time for a, a, like a modern era part two, although I was corrected that that would be a modern era part three, because the first modern era was, anyway, um, you know what I'm saying. Um, so um, so I, want, I, you know, I, I structured a few questions around this. I wanted to sort of tease this idea out with everybody. Um, my first question really is, is the answer getting, getting really a lot bigger? You know, will having more huge REITs and conventional asset classes help to balance out this benchmark problem and then everything will act more like real estate? Do, do you believe that we're gonna see massive consolidation, Lisa? And, if, and do you think that would be good? Uh, well, I, I think there will be some consolidation, and I hope, like, like Cedric predicted, that it will be the REITs playing that role of, of consolidator, and I think that will generally be a good thing. I mean, it, the reason it's a good thing is it drives scale, and, you know, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that. The, 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 the bad thing about consolidation, though, is that it, it makes your asset base larger, and it makes delivering that growth that, that investors want more challenging. Right. So, but but the scale issue is is real, and the reason that it it is valuable is that it gives companies resources to to continue to invest and build and develop 
a great operating platform. And I think that's, that's one of the things that perhaps investors don't appreciate about REITs. I mean, REITs, that's really a differentiating factor for REITs, the, the, the strength of the operating platforms. I think it's really exciting that a lot of the top companies in the space now are not traditional sectors. You know, that, um, that's, really, that's really interesting. And that, to me, that says that we're not still in 1.0 or 2.0. We have, the sector has really evolved. Um, you know, there is a lot more representation of niche or alternative or whatever you want to call them. Gaming, you heard from um, Ed earlier today about the gaming sector, which is still in a pretty early stage of kind of going mainstream and being adopted. You heard Ron Havner talk about the public storage, you know, sector. That's a great example. I mean, very much a fringe sector when it entered the public sphere, but it through consolidation, through development of, of, of professional professionalization of the operating platform, you know, they, they were able to deliver really good growth to shareholders, attract more capital, drive cap rates down, deliver terrific total returns. And now that sector is probably considered more core than the traditional sector, yeah. certainly than office and, and retail today. So um, I think it's I think that there's a pretty good um, I think that the, that REITs have a pretty good mousetrap. It has been um, underappreciated for the last few years when capital has been so so cheap, um, and pri and there's been so the fund flows to private real estate have been so strong. But I I, I think that there, I, I think there may be an inflection point ahead. Thanks. Um, one of the ways um, one of the ways that some companies have tried to leverage off their strength and um, with, uh, the, the most successful one being Prologis has been pursuing a fund management model, um, managing assets for other people, um, uh, and collecting fees from other investors, um, and uh, also while providing real estate fundamentals. Um, do you think, Cedric, do you, do you like that model? Do you think that there's a lot more companies that, that can do that? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I think it's, it's an interesting model for companies that have scale to start with. So, so you need the scale, obviously. And the, and the reason you look at Prologis, and, and a, when AMB and Prologis were competing many, many years ago when they were separate, um, they were both running fund models as well. There, there were good things that occurred from it, and there were tough things that occurred from it as well. Uh, I think the fund model can make sense for companies that are seeking to greatly expand the pie in which they're playing in order to have customer relationships, in order to perhaps at, at a lower price point, uh, at a lower amount of their own capital, be active in certain markets. But in general, the fund management business, I think, is not a key to growing for the real estate, for the REIT business. So for most REITs, that's for the vast majority of REITs, I should say, uh, the fund management business is not going to be an avenue of success. I think it is for, again, uh, a handful that have developed the expertise or that can benefit from the customer relationships. There are real financial benefits that can occur in terms of the asset management fee. Uh, sorry, I should say more the, the fund management fee itself. The asset management tends to be not, or the property management tends to be a little bit lower profitability or very, very much lower profitability. So it's more generating the, the asset management uh, benefit from it. But it comes at complications at the management level. It comes at question marks in terms of do you favor the assets in the JV or the assets on your balance sheet. Uh, so I think it creates a number of questions for investors that limit the appeal overall. So it works for, for Prologis without a doubt. I think it works for EXR, for instance. But in general, uh, I think the fund business is not necessarily the best way to grow the pie for a REIT. Nick, what do you think? What if yeah. they only do a little bit, a yeah. little bit of it? <laughs> I think the scale is the key, right, and minimizing conflicts of interest. And so it's always hard. Um, on balance sheet versus what's in the JV or what's in the fund um, and any kind of conflicting decisions that could arise from that. And so you wanna make sure all incentives are aligned there. Uh, but I do think for, for larger companies where there's an opportunity to really get either better data, anal data analytics or any other kind of ancillary benefits to the broader um, franchise while also deriving some economic benefit from doing it could make sense. But I, I'd agree with Cedric, it's in the select uh, situations. All right, Gina, I know how you feel about that one because you already <laughs> yeah. told us. <laughs> um, and one, another thing I wanted to ask, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you is, um, you know, Lisa was talking about um, 
uh, you know, it was a brilliant example of how, um, how public storage was considered um, like a super unusual thing, and now it is the corest of core real estate. Um, and I never thought, you know, I never thought that I would see billboard, billboard REITs um, passed on the digital realty IPO. I'm, I'm on that board. I passed on the IPO because I didn't understand how technology could create like a net larger demand for space. Always right off and early sometimes. <laughs> um, but I wanted to know, if, you know, what's on your radar in terms of, you know, if any emerging um, REIT suitable asset classes? Um, so I guess it depends on your definition of emerging, right? So, um, you know, towers, timber, uh, casinos now. I mean, there's a lot of market cap uh, in the public domain at this yeah. point. So I, I don't really consider those sectors emerging, even though they might fall into that bucket, you know, on paper. Um, what, I, what I would say um, is what I'd like to see more of uh, is uh, single family rental and manufactured housing. Um, so for example, um, I was an investor in American Homes for Rent pre-IPO, mm -hmm. and that was a long time ago, mm -hmm. right? Um, the combined market cap of single family rental today is between 30 and 35 billion. I mean, Vici got there in five years, right? <laughs> yeah. um, storage did a great job uh, growing in the last five years. Um, I'd love to see more companies and more market cap. Um, in the, in the niche residential space. Love that. Any other asset ideas before I go to the next one? Um, so um, before we get to Q&A, um, you know, I, you know I, I love that we put this on for the students, and I know that it is not the best time to be, gra you know, it's not the best time to be graduating with a degree in real estate. It's a super uncertain time, and so many programs are on pause. Um, I advise a lot of young people, um, including my own children, on this topic. Um, and um, you know, some some of the other panels have talked about career advice and things. But I just wanted to go starting maybe starting with Gina, do, whether it's advice to your younger self um, that would be helpful to the students, or advice for the students, sure. or if anyone wants. If you want to take anybody's resume, also. <laughs> um, well, I did point out that AEW is hiring, <laughs> so go on the website, see what see, see what's out there for you. Um, I, I would say uh, my number one piece of advice is embrace the volatility. Um, so, in my first ten years um, working. I saw a lot. I mean, interest rates went up by 500 basis points. They went down by 500 basis points. They went up again by 500 basis points. Um, there was a dot-com bubble, the GFC, um, all of that. Uh, if you started in this industry in 2008 or 9, um, you had eight years where n nothing happened. I mean, the Fed didn't raise interest rates. And then you had another three years uh, where it took the Fed uh, three years to raised 200 basis points. Um, so, I mean, volatility is experience. Um, it shows you everything you need to know to last a long time in this business. So um, it's, you know, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. So. <laughs> Cedric, what about you? Uh, so I approach it a little differently. Um, also, if kids are about college age, so <laughs> like you, I think about this way too much. Um, it, you know, first of all, if, if you're in college right now, you're already resilient because you went in thinking you'd have the sweet experience and you ended up with uh, a COVID experience. So you've learned the power of resilience. Resilience is tremendous uh, as far as continuing in your career. Uh, the second thing that I find extremely important is work ethics. There's work ethics fixes a lot of problems. Uh, hard working will put you over the hill in, in many ways, uh, in, in a very positive way. Third is control what you can control. Who cares what the person next to you does? Just control what you can control. I've found that to be extremely, extremely important over time. And then finally, just treat people nicely. Um, treat them like you want to be treated. I find that to be very important. Um, all four of these things, I don't know if I live them all the time. So, <laughs> right, we give advice, we do our best. Uh, we don't always live them all the time, but um, if you can do, all of this in some good quantity, it should work out all right. Awesome. Lisa, what about you? Yeah, well, if I could give some advice to my 20-year-old self, I would say don't be so afraid to make a mistake. Um, that, and that goes for navigating your career, you know, whether it, anything from speaking up in a meeting to raising your hand for a stretch assignment to participating on a panel, um, you know, going outside your comfort zone. 
but I, I think it can also apply to looking, navigating a job market, especially in a difficult time. I mean, I, I, just a quick story, when I was graduating from college, my father actually really wanted me to take a year off and be a ski bum for a year, go wait tables. And I was too afraid to do that because I thought I would get off track and I would get left behind. And I'm very lucky, I don't have a lot of regrets, but I, I wish I had that decision back, you know, because you just don't do that again. So I would say for all of you, if there's, don't tell your parents I said this, but if there's, <laughs> if there's something, you know, interesting, fun, different that you can do, um, and you have the opportunity to do it, do it and don't worry about getting, you know, having your career, career be derailed. It, it, it won't be. And, and in fact, it might even make you a more interesting job candidate when you do kind of pivot back to the, to the corporate world. I, I'd agree with uh, everything that was said before. I, I was kind of taking this in a different way. Um, I think having the right mentor and the right people around you is incredibly important. Um, you know, to tie it back to, Mary, one of your questions on the board, right? Basically having your own personal board of directors. It could be parents, it could be friends you really respect, it could be uh, people within the organization. Uh, but there are a lot of decisions that come up within your career, right? And the grass is not always greener. Sometimes it's the right time to make a move, sometimes it's not. But having the ability to rely on people that you know have your best interest and you really respect their opinions, I think goes a long way to help you decide. Ultimately, you have to make your own decision, but to have some people to bounce ideas off of, um, I think is very important. Thanks, that's actually, all of this is really great advice for people, even those who are not students at NYU, so I hope everyone <laughs> takes it to heart. Um, we're, we're closing down, um, but we do have time for a question or two if anybody has anything for us. You look hungry. <laughs> I might uh, say, uh, first of all, one of the reasons that I, that I don't mind activism is I feel, I feel confident that the companies I work with are, are doing the right thing. Um, I, do, I do differentiate from, there, there's, there's different kinds of activists. There's activists that know our space really well. Um, there's activists that pounce when they know a company's about to do the right thing. That's the most annoying kind of activist. <laughs> um, and then we've only had a few examples of, of really big, um, uh, you know, uh, really uh, aggressive, um, well-known um, people that really tear apart everybody associated with the company. So I think, but I think you take each of them very seriously. What do you, I'm so rude, I'm the moderator. Sorry, what, what, do, you, what do you guys think? That's good to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, and I think Nick said at some point, uh, and rightfully so, not all activists are created equal. So it's, uh, as much as I love activism, and I, I've said very clearly, uh, there are clearly some folks that understand the business and go after, I'd say, targets that deserve to get a letter and people that uh, you wonder what they're doing a little bit. What I like more is not the activism in action, but rather the threat of activism, which is creating a mindset of being more shareholder friendly. I think that's what I like even more than an actual moment of action from an activist. 15 seconds. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Thanks for all coming. Really appreciate it. Thanks to the panelists.